Good morning to everyone. It's good to see all of you. We thank you for being here. Appreciate it very much. We, of course, this morning are starting a study of Isaiah. Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah a minor prophet or a major prophet? Why is he a major prophet? <laughs> More words. That's all it is. The minor prophets are called minor because they wrote less words. The major prophets major because they wrote more words. Just the way men decided to identify. Isaiah is an interesting book, as most of you know. People argue about it a lot. I'm not going to tell you that I understand every passage in it. I'll do my best to try. But I guarantee you that some of you may have a disagreement over some of the passages. The key to a lot of them is the understanding of the first 39 books start out as what? Anybody know? Okay, they start out as a rebuke, basically, don't they? The Israelites were doing sin. They were causing themselves to be putrid to God as his people. And therefore, God is going to tell them about it through his prophet Isaiah. Who does Isaiah prophesy to? Judah. Judah. That's correct. He will have some things to say about Israel, but he is primarily a prophet to Judah. And as a prophet to Judah, he will chastise Judah for its behavior and its actions. We're actually starting out in the New Testament. Imagine that. Starting out in the New Testament for us. Yes, dear? The last 27 verses, or chapters yes. are giving them hope in the way of the Savior. Kind of like the 27 chapters that are hope of the New Testament. That's correct. This thing have a pointer? Ah, there it is. So this is a book of rebuke and discipline. But it's also a book of hope. 39 chapters of rebuke and discipline and judgments. And 27 chapters of what? Of hope. Of hope through the Messiah that is to come. Yes? Did Isaiah describe what chapters were I doubt it. <laughs> but I never got to ask him, so I don't know for sure. Yes, right. Isaiah is also known as the statesman. Uh, he dealt with a lot of government officials. He did. He did. Yeah, in fact, some believe that he was related to some of the government officials. Yes, Wayne. Are you going to comment on authorship? Ah, we are going to get to authorship. It's probably down the road a ways because I got so much introduction. <laughs> We're going to be a while. But yes, absolutely. What do you want to say about it now? You're more than welcome. Oh, you're going to hold on to it. Okay. Don't worry. Uh, I'm anxious. I don't know if I can stand it. Ask it. Let's go. Whether Isaiah wrote, was the author of all of the books, yes. whether there were other authors in the book. And that's a great debate. That's a great debate in the fact that this latter portion of it, many scholars believe Isaiah didn't write it all. What do you think? Well, bottom line, the apostles uh, spoke of it. It definitely came before Jesus ever was on the cross. So somebody's being revealed to by God. Absolutely. And as he's quoted in the New Testament in some of those later chapters, who is identified as writing it? Isaiah. Isaiah is. So who should we believe? Some later scholars? Or should we think that those people in the New Testament got it right? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Yes. Unless well, there is actual documentation that that sort of thing happened, but just on, on faith in, in the Word of God, I think he did. Good. What is the most important thing for a scholar to do? A fleshly scholar to do. Keep an open mind. Okay, that would be the greatest thing to do. Yes, Christian first.
there's lots of uh, scholars in general should uh, should uh, ge generally maintain a good source. Okay. All right. Study source. No. Yes. Somebody in the back. Rochelle. Research. Research. Okay. And. Okay. Somebody like that we need to have who has the background and the knowledge and study of what really took place. But with some scholars, the greatest thing they can do is cause a, a controversy. And that does what for them? <laughs> it gets their name known. And so I've even read some commentaries who make an argument all the way and then they get to the end and they say, but this might not be true. <laughs> now, why do they do that? Again, they're men. They have a reputation and they want to make a reputation. It is true that Isaiah was almost always in how many scrolls? Most of them were in two, although they did divide into four and six when they had to read them. Yes? You kind of, go with where I was going to go, the, probably one of the greatest things in our lifetime is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes. In which the entire book of Isaiah was, was there. Yes. And um, Isaiah is known as the Messianic prophet. There's yes. There's more told about the Messiah 600 years, 400 years, whatever it was. That's right. Before Christ. Yes. In, in the future, we uh, you know, prove it. Yes. And he's quoted more than any others in the New Testament. Pardon? Looks a lot like that. Yeah, did look a lot like that, didn't it? This is actually what they refer to as a simile or whatever. I don't remember the exact word they used. In other words, somebody took pictures of the original. Nobody could touch it. And then they went and made one to look like it so they could send it out and you could buy one of these now, by the way, if you want to, in the gift shops of some of the places. But nevertheless, the whole idea was that these Dead Sea Scrolls were a prize to us and to others of the religious world. And in a prize, they showed us some of the things that others had denied. And so, again, we always get to that point where somebody new is discovered, and it always does what? It always supports the scriptures, proves the Bible, backs up what most scholars, religious, of course, believe. So those are the things that we want to go. Let's go to 1 Peter 1.3 for a minute. I call 1 Peter 1.3 a mission statement. Somebody tell me what a mission statement is. Jeff? Just your, your goal, what you're trying to get after, the ultimate okay. end. Okay. All right. Christian, you had... Okay, all right. A lot of companies have them. They want to try to explain themselves in them. They want to lay a foundation for who they are. And they want people to read it and understand who they are. All right, somebody want to read three through, where am I going? I didn't say. Let's go three through six. Who wants to read for me? Go ahead, Christian. Okay, stop there for a minute and tell me what's in that verse. God, the Father? Yeah, he's right there, isn't he? And who? Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ. And who, what does he say about him? God showed his great mercy. By giving whom? Or by sending whom? Jesus Christ. He has caused us to be born again. What does that mean, born again? Yes, Brad. Well, as Jesus told Nicodemus, is being born of the water and the spirit. Yes. A new spiritual creature. Okay, a new creature in a new creation, in a new kingdom, according to the grace and mercy of God that has the forgiveness of Jesus Christ so that we might be anew again. All right? And then he goes on to say, this is to a what? A living hope. And what's the proof of that? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Does God have power over life? Yes. He does. Does he give it to those whom will follow after his son through great mercy and grace? Yes. 
Yes, He does. We can be born again. We can have this life. This is part of our what? Belief, faith, mission statement. Is it not? Christian, go on with verse 4 and 5. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guard, guarded through faith, faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, is this eternal or is this temporary? This is eternal. This is in heaven. This is forever. And it's protected by whom? The power of God. Is there any greater power than the power of God? Is there any way or anything, as the Apostle Paul said, that could take away the salvation of Jesus Christ from us? He lists a whole list of things there, even deaths in there. Can that take away? No, it cannot. All right, verse 6. Christian? So, temporarily, right now, here, as we live, can it feel kind of difficult? Will it feel kind of difficult? There is no doubt. Every one of us will have those various trials. Verse 7, Christian. All right, when Jesus comes again, will this be worth it? Absolutely, it will, won't it? Now, why did I want to read that before we study Isaiah? Yes, Steve? Because it's the prophecy fulfilled. It is. It's 39 chapters of trials, difficulties, and judgments but it's 27 chapters of greatness headed our way. Now, if you were in Isaiah's day, are you going to live long enough to see what he's talking about? So what is it by? It's by hope. It's by hope. What's our hope today? Heaven. It's by hope. Are you still in the trials of the 30, 39 chapters? Well, yeah, you are to some degree. The 27 chapters of the greatness of Jesus Christ, we certainly see, we know, we look back on. We know more than Isaiah ever knew, don't we? Yes, we do, because we have the full revelation of the mystery of God revealed to us. But the fact is, we still don't have the reality of heaven yet, do we? No. Are we anxious for it? Do we look forward to it? Absolutely. Yes. But God's right. continue to work on us while we're here. He is. And that's what that refining of gold, gold is purified. Yeah. Run through the furnace and the impurities are taken out. Yes. Pure gold. Yes. That's what we're going through now. You ever heard gold squeal when you put it in the fire? I no, I haven't either. It doesn't squeal, does it? How about Christians who go through various trials? We have a tendency to do that a little bit, don't we? But if we know, if we understand, if we're spiritual, if we're that new creation, born again creature, we know what the trials are for, don't we? Will they produce patience, endurance? Will they produce even things like loving kindness? Of course they will. These are the things that God expects to produce in us. All right, we talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls the full concept of Isaiah being in there and verifying the text and again I believe help prove that Isaiah wrote them because they were in two different scrolls this is just more proof to the things that are going on if you have your binder you won't find this one in here I have a terrible habit I keep studying I keep deciding I need more things in there so this morning at 5 a.m. I added this one. <laughs> You're just going to have to read it from the screen. I'm sorry. But what is it about? 
I wanted to establish this concept of B.C. and A.D. before we ever go any further because we're going to talk history. Everybody knows what B.C. and A.D. mean, right? What's B.C.? Before Christ. It's simple. We understand that. But A.D. isn't after death, is it? Although a lot of people think it is. What is A.D.? In the year of the Lord. Anna Dominique, in the year of our Lord, it means that God actually put a division in time based on his plan with his son. Now, how in the world did he do that? Yeah, he did it by power, didn't he? Do we still use it today? Oh, there is a group that's trying to get rid of it. They go to this BCE and CE. The alternate using B.C. and A.D. would use B.C.E., which means before common era, and C.E., which means common era. And they do that in order to try to discount what? God, Jesus Christ, and the religious authority that has established this over time, which is God, by the power of God. Despite removing Christianity from the name of these two, to the original Christian idea of B.C. and A.D. That's because of all of these abbreviations use the same date as the starting point. So did they really accomplish anything? Other than disguising it as something else, they use the same dates. They go backwards from when Christ was born, or at least his life. There's much argument as to when this actually starts. And they go after Christ or his birth, or his existence, for A.D. So it doesn't change much, actually, but it is something that you might see in scholarly papers rather than the B.C. and A.D. All right, let's get into some of these things. As we move forward, and I'm going to turn around for most of these because it's easier for me to use the pointer, you have a lot of charts. Bev already asked me, do I have to memorize these? <laughs> and the answer is, of course not. What they're there for is for our learning. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? These things are here for our learning. The Old Testament that we read and study and want to know more about, that's absolutely correct. And there, I am trying to give us various different charts that show different things. I'm not going to study every chart thoroughly, but if you want to at home, that's fantastic. Please do. The charts are all borrowed, by the way. I didn't make all of these up. Uh, I would need another six months before we start if I was going to make these up myself. But I've reviewed them all. There are a few things I disagree with here and there on a few of the charts, but it's not a big deal. It's usually about dates. And frankly, when you get to dates, who's right? <coughs> nobody. <laughs> God. Usually nobody's right because we don't exactly know unless we have a scriptural reference to an actual time period or date. We don't actually know. These are what we call what? Educated guesses. Educated guess, approximations. These are what scholars decide. This is approximately when this happened or that happened. So when we refer to dates, if you think it's a day or a year or two off here and there, that's fine. I'll probably agree with you. It's probably off somehow. I don't know exactly how. This one starts off with whom? How, how much further back should we go? <laughs> that's kind of it, isn't it? You've got to start somewhere. You're going to start somewhere. You're going to start with the beginning. That's Adam. Most scholars believe that that's around 4,000 B.C. Now, why a big round number? Yeah, it's an estimation. We don't know for sure. Adam did not send me a memo or an email that told me when he existed, so I can't exactly tell you for sure when that date is. You will get it refined by some scholars down to years, and I'm not sure how they got there, to be honest with you. But nevertheless, we go from Adam to Noah, to Abraham, to Jacob, to Joseph, Egypt, and Moses. Through these various different time periods, there's history. Who has the best history of this time? God does. 
The Bible does. Scripture does. In fact, the scholars who want to know about these time periods, they go to the Bible to fill in what they need to know because they have no other history. They have no other documents. They have a small amount of documents they can use. And they help to some degree, but they're much less than what God has preserved for us and those who believe in the Bible. And so as we go through these things, these dates are trying to follow after what happened to Scripture. From Moses, Exodus, Joshua, Judges, Saul, David, Solomon. This takes us all the way through to the great king or kingdom of Israel at its what? Its peak. Its most magnificent. What it really was. What God promised he could make it if they would just do what? Follow him. Stay with him. Obey him. Do the things that he asked them to do. When we go from there, of course, there's a divided kingdom. What do I mean by the divided kingdom? Okay. When Solomon, who had 700 wives, royal and foreign to him, began to follow after what? Those false gods, their idols, to please those women. Gentlemen, there's a lesson here. To please those women. And when he did that, was God pleased? God was not pleased. We'll get to that later. We're going to actually read the scriptures about that. So, at the end of Solomon's reign, what happened? Yes? Poor leadership. It was poor leadership, wasn't it? At the end of his reign, what happened? Two kings came forward, didn't they? What are their names? Jeroboam, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. One's in the north, one's in the south. Which one's which? I always get those mixed up. She always corrects me. <laughs> I like that. She's right. Jeroboam was in the north, and he had how many tribes? Ten, Ten tribes. Ten out of what? how many? Twelve. Twelve. Whoa, he wins, right? Yep. Oh, wait. He doesn't win, does he? And there, there's two tribes to the south, isn't there? And those two tribes to the south, do they outlast the ten tribes to the north? They do, in the divided kingdom. Now where does Isaiah fall in here? Yes? Okay. We're going to get to there. But Hezekiah backwards, actually, is where you're looking. Yes? Yep. Similar? Okay, so he's going to actually exist, if you believe all of the scholars, he's going to actually exist in five kings. All right? Now, one of them doesn't last very long, but nevertheless, five of them. He really has something to do with primarily three of them. He comes in at the end of Uzziah, and he goes out at the beginning of Manasseh. Those are the kings that he is existing between during the divided kingdom. The kingdom of Israel, here are the kings that are in the north to the ten tribes before they go into Assyrian captivity. The kingdom to the south, which is Judah, which is Rehoboam, goes all the way to Hezekiah, Josiah, Zedekiah, until they get to Babylonian captivity. We have a more detailed map our chart of this. If you can see that one, you're better off than I am. You have to look at that one in your book. It's for your study. It's much more detailed. We're not going to spend time on it here today, but it gives you a lot of detail that past chart did not give, and it will give you references when you're reading and studying Isaiah. It will give you references that you can go back to to have a better understanding of what was going on during that specific time period. All right, let's jump to this one. Where am I at? Let me get my computer caught up here. All right. What are the three primary divisions of the scriptures? Test. You didn't know you were having a test, did you? Patriarchal law. Okay. Mosaic and Christian age. Those are the three ages we normally divide the scriptures up into. Which one do we live in? 
the Christian age. Obviously, Jesus Christ has come, he's died, he has established his kingdom, and we are part of that kingdom. All right. Which one did Isaiah live in? The second one, the Mosaic age. Mosaical age. And why? He wasn't Moses. Why did he? he? He wasn't under the law in the sense that it was written and he lived in the wilderness with Moses, did he? So why was he under the Mosaical law? He continued after Moses. How long did the Mosaical law actually continue? Yeah, all the way to Christ coming. And Christ said he didn't come to do away with it, but to do what with it? To fulfill it, to accomplish it, to do exactly what it asked from God, his people to do, Jesus Christ was going to do, and then it would not need to be anymore. Because he would change it to a new kingdom. It did. Actually, I would argue it lasted till the day of Pentecost, but that's an argument we can make or not make. Yes, Brad? Well, it does, as we've stated in some of our previous days, exactly what God purposed to do is to bring out the idea that they can't conquer sin by themselves. And Isaiah's going to start that way. He's going to yes. start talking about all the things they're doing wrong. Yes, absolutely. And pointing out the sin, and that's what the Old Testament, the Old Mosaical Covenant was meant to do. Yes. Was to point out the sin and that so how is it for our learning? You pretty much dated it, didn't you? It's for our learning show that, so that we can see the successes and failures in the flesh by a people of the flesh concerning the law of God. Now, we are a people of the flesh, but literally we are more what? A people in spirit. Do we fail sometimes? Do we succeed sometimes? Are we a whole lot different than they were? Really, we're not. We try to say we are. We want to think we are. But when we look back at them with condemnation, what are we kind of doing? Yeah, we are condemning ourselves to some degree, aren't we? Because we have the similar failures. And God's probably been pretty upset with me at times. Yeah, that's the way it is. Okay, so we have the patriarchal age, and then we go through Abraham and all of his family, and we get to Moses, and this is the Exodus, about 1300 BCE. You notice the BCE in there? Yeah, yeah, they got to get it in there, even when they're writing religious things. But the Exodus of Moses, what happened to Abraham's family? Okay, that's what will happen eventually, but what happened to Abraham's family going into Egypt? He was, Joseph was carried into Egypt by, his, by a caravan. And Joseph was a type and shadow of what? Jesus. A savior, all right? Yes, Brad. And if they grew and were blessed and were growing into the nation that God promised Abraham. Yeah, and who didn't like it? Egypt didn't like it. Evil didn't like it. Satan didn't like it. And so what did he do to them? What God had promised to Abraham was going to happen. A smoking oven. What is a smoking oven? It's the tribulation of the bondage of the people in Egypt. That's what the smoking oven was. And he told Abraham right up front that was going to take place to his people. But Moses, of course... 40 years a little early, but Moses, of course, decided that he could free them, didn't he? And when God decided that they would be freed, he called Moses back. And Moses went down and we, we studied the ten plagues. What were those things, ten plagues? They were judgments. God's judgments on a nation that was mistreating his people. And God's judgments eventually caused Pharaoh to do what? To do what? <laughs> to let them go, as Moses kept saying over and over and over, quoting God, let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh wasn't willing to do that. Read Pharaoh in Romans chapter 9, you'll have fun with that. 
Okay, conquest and sentiment went all the way through the period of the judges. Then, of course, we have this united kingdom, which David and Solomon created as great, the divided kingdom in which Isaiah will exist, and then we will go on to Judah alone, and then the Babylonian exile as well as the Assyrian exile that, that Israel already went into. And then they will have a return after 70 years. Why 70 years? God said so. You know, sometimes in the Old Testament, the best answer you can give me when I ask a question is, God said so. <laughs> That's why. And I don't know exactly. Yes, hi. Were they safe? Yes, they were saved. Absolutely. Is that what you asked? I'm sorry. Oh, what does it say about Noah's family? It says they come out of the ark. God blessed them. Noah made a couple of mistakes, but then his family went forth, and one of them was cursed. And the curse happened, what he did to his father. Which one is it? Caleb? No. Ham. Thank you. Ham. Yes. Ham was the one that was cursed. And uh, we'll get into that study another time, probably. But nevertheless, very good. Thank you. All right. So as we move forward, then, I move into history, history. Now, what do I mean by history, history? This is man's history. The reason that I want to say history, history for this is because... Men need how much evidence for the things God says? How much evidence do they need for their own stuff? <laughs> That's right. So these charts that I'm going to show you right now are men's ideas of what took place in history with very little true evidence. I mean, they may have a clay tablet. It may be the corner of it. It may be about this big, and it may have part of the name of the guy they're talking about on it. And that's it. That's all they need, because they've decided that's what happened. But when it comes to God's Word, they want a whole lot of uh, history and evidence, don't they? All right, so what do we have in history, history? Going back to 3,000, we have one, two, three, four, five, what they call six. Primary what? Civilizations or empires, however you want to call it. And the civilizations or empires of these six, do they play an effect or have any effect on what God did? Yeah, yeah they do play into it. Yes, Brett. I'd say they didn't have an effect, but God used them. Good way to put it. God used them, God chose them, and God allowed them is what happened. And so we're going to see that right up front when we get into Isaiah because the first one that pops up is what? Assyria. Yes. God's going to say he chose them. And what did he choose them for? Punish Israel for his discipline, didn't he? Does God use nations against nations for discipline? Oh, yeah, he does. Absolutely he does. And he does this time and time and time again. Does he still do this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I can't tell you for sure. I mean, when he tells me he does it, I can tell you I know. When he doesn't tell me he does it, although it looks like it, I just have to say I don't know. Because Solomon does make it clear, sometimes things are just what? Time and chance. Yeah. And we have to live with that. We have to accept that. All right. So as we go on, there were a Sumer, Akkad, Babylon, Assyrian, Chaldean Babylon, and Persian time periods, empires, civilizations, things that took place during this period of time. Does God work during those periods of time? Yes, he does. Is God's people exist during those periods of time? Yes, they do. Is God 
carry out his will, <clears throat> excuse me, his will during those periods of time. Yes, he does. And so we need to keep in mind that even though man has created a history, and it is interesting, and it is important, and I want to talk about it, we need to know that God had a history within that history, and a history that we have more about than we will ever have about this broad history that they are trying to tell us existed. Yes, Brian. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that fascinating? When you get to scholars like this who want to write the history books and they read those things, where do they put that? They put it in the pile with everything else. They put it in the pile like it's just another piece of history. And yet, there is no piece of history that does details and exactness like God has given to Daniel. It doesn't exist. And so we need to have that understanding. We need to understand that what God gives us is always full of details and always absolutely what? Correct, accurate, perfect. There is no doubt whatsoever. So according to these many civilizations controlled by the Mesopotamia region, or the Crescent, as they call it, we have Abraham through Solomon that fell between these two primary civilizations. Where will Isaiah fall? He will fall right here, before Syria and after Syria, in a period of time in which he will talk about things that won't happen till when? Over here. Over here. That's when they will happen. Now how in the world can he do that? Inspired by God. God has the power to know the future, does he not? What about the people, the scholars that say, well, that book was just written hundreds of years later, and therefore it was writing about history, but claiming it was written before. Is that possible? Actually, with the, his, with the history that we have, it's not possible with Isaiah. But it is possible for man to try such a thing. What's the name of the books that men have tried it in with Christ? They're called the apocryphal books. They're books that were written after the first century, and the names of people who lived in the first century were put on the book, and the author claimed to be that they were written by those earlier men. Why did they do that? Why does a scholar try to change history or come up with something new? Yeah. He wants a name for himself. He, notoriety. He wants to show the world how smart he is. He wants a reputation. And he does want to mislead, of course. There are false prophets throughout the history that have done so. All right, let's move along. I don't, how much time do I have? When do I have to finish? Oh, I got three minutes. <laughs> we didn't get very far, but let's see if we can get through this one. This is map form of what you just looked at. All right? It's history history, meaning man's history. And it's got those six civilizations in them. What do you see about all six maps? that's familiar. Same. same area. They're all fighting over the same area during different periods of time. Now the one that really didn't get as big as the rest of them during that period of time was the first what? Babylonian Empire. And why didn't it get as big as the rest of them in the Fertile Crescent? God didn't want it to. Because God was working Abraham through Solomon at the time, wasn't he? And he didn't need or want Babylon in his way at that moment, did he? He will bring up Assyria when it comes time for what? Discipline. When it comes time to take the northern, ten northern tribes into captivity. 
but he won't let them come up in a worldwide fertile crescent domination until that point. Now, Judah was still in the presence of God at that point. When Assyria came upon Judah, what happened to them? God destroyed them. He sent them back with their tail between their legs. Hezekiah was told after he prayed to God that they would not take Jerusalem. And they did not take Jerusalem by the power of God. So again, who's really in charge here? Over and over and over again, this is something we really need to learn. Over and over and over again, we see in history how the power of God usurps the authority of man and every time he does it, we can see it not only in history of, of the scriptures, but also in history history, if it's honest, of men. And we see it in these six great nations where one of them doesn't get the whole fertile basin like the other ones did. And it's because God is working his people at this moment in time. And until he gives up on his people and takes them away into captivity, he allows Assyria to first come forward and then Babylon. And then Daniel said, from Babylon, what will we have? The Medo-Persians, where Cyrus and Darius would come forward and be God's servants. And they would send them back to their land. And from the Medo-Persians, we were going to the Grecians or the Greeks. And from the Greeks, the Romans will come forward, and that's where God stops because God wants those to be known because the greatest kingdom of the world will happen during what? The Roman Empire. The kingdom of Jesus Christ our Lord. We're out of time. Thank you very much for your kind attention.